All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to our students here. Good morning to those who are online as well. All right. So before we begin, let's just uh, pray. Let's say a word of prayer and submit this hour into God's hand. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your word that is alive, that's powerful, that will minister to our hearts, O oh God. And even as we study lord we pray that holy spirit you will speak to our hearts lord that everything that we learn let it be a seed in our hearts that will bear fruit in our lives oh god we submit this time into your hands in jesus name we pray amen, amen. right uh, i hope the audio is fine on online yeah okay all right so uh last week we talked about uh the evangelist Right, we saw the ministry of the evangelist, and how, uh, and we also saw how Jesus led the example of being an evangelist. Right, he he was empowered, he he had a certain kind of audience, he had a message, message of repentance, of uh, forgiveness, the kingdom of God. Then uh, we also looked at his methods. So wherever he went, he he taught, he preached. It was followed by signs, wonders, and miracles. And then he traveled from place to place. Uh, he was motivated to do that. Uh, there were challenges. People were, had unbelief. People, there were demonic oppositions. There were people who uh, stopped him from trying to do ministry. And uh, we saw that he was able to overcome those obstacles. And finally, we saw that he also got support, support from people around, uh, not just financial support, but also uh, people just came in and began to serve alongside with Jesus, right? So today we look at chapter 3, um, and chapter 3 is the evangelist in the early church, right? So we looked at the evangelist. Now, we know that the word evangelist came out only when the, the Apostle Paul started writing, and it became more, you know, people started using it more after the Apostle Paul's writing on the fivefold ministry. But the moment the church started in, in the book of Acts, right, when we look at uh, the church in Jerusalem and going down chapter four, chapter five, you will see uh, aspects of the evangelist um, upon people. And you will see aspects of evangelism in the church, in the ministry, right? What the Apostle Paul did was he he added a structure, right? So, for example, if you look at the word Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? it's there from the beginning. But when the Apostle Paul explains it, it you know, we try to, we understand it better, right? And even when John, the disciple, explains Trinity, we understand better. So... The elements are always there. Right? You're getting what I'm saying, right? So the elements are all, always there, but the word came into being much later, right? So we look at the evangelist. Three Greek words uh, before we get into what uh, the evangelist did in the early church. So three Greek words. Now, there, there are two things that we must remember. There's Greek, there's ancient Greek. Right now, it's very important to understand when you're studying scripture, especially the New Testament, to always go back to the Greek and the ancient Greek because it adds so much of value to understand. Right? So, for example, Acts 1 8, I think I mentioned this before. Uh, the original translation for Acts 1 8 is very powerful. Right? We all know Acts 1 8. What does it say? It's a very common verse, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria. Now, when we read it, it's like, yeah, we'll be witnesses. But the Greek for the word witness is martyr. So if you're reading the Greek translation, and say, you will receive power to be a martyr. So martyr is somebody who's willing to give his life for Christ, his or her life for Christ. So, so it's very important to go back to the Greek, go back to certain words where you can really add flavor to scripture. So let's look at the three Greek words considered in, when it comes to evangelism, evangelism, evangelist. First one, now you don't need to 
be able to pronounce those words, right? Uh, but just getting the meaning of those words are very important. Uh, Eugen, which is a noun, uh, it means bearer of good tidings. Right now, last semester we did a little bit of lifestyle evangelism, uh, but here it says a bearer of good tidings, and it is over 50 times in the New Testament. Right? So think of it this way when you and I are ministering the gospel, we are bearers of good tidings, we are evangelists. Right? Eugolizio which is the verb which is used 77 times in the New Testament, which means to preach the gospel, right? Now, these words were given part of, uh, were part of the purpose of the ministry of the evangelist. Let's look at the third word. You, you, <laughs> okay. You, Galistus. Okay. Thank you. Right. Which means, the title means evangelist. Right now, these words are used three times in in the scriptures. Now let's read Acts chapter twenty one and verse eight. Acts twenty one verse eight. Go ahead. Acts chapter 21 verse 8. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. Yeah. So here is the first time Philip is being considered the evangelist. Right. Now, if you look previously, now this is in Acts, what, Acts 21, which is just before Paul's third missionary journey. So he's already finished first one. He's finished his second missionary journey. He comes back to Jerusalem in the same chapter. If you go down, he's come back to Jerusalem and ready for his third missionary journey. So already he's done a lot of ministry. But this is the first time Philip is considered as an evangelist. right? But was he doing the work of an evangelist? Yes. Much way before he he probably didn't know he was an evangelist, but over time said, Okay, they recognize the gift of the evangelist. But nowhere in the in the scriptures that is say Paul the evangelist, right? Or Barnabas the evangelist. No. Why? Because again, the ministry gifts, right? The fivefold ministry. So God places on people certain gifts and others can recognize it right so the first time is here acts 21 where philip has the tag the evangelist let's read uh ephesians 4 11. it's a fivefold ministry ephesians 4 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Yeah. Now, another thing that we can do is if you look at the book of Acts and you want to see the life of an evangelist, one, you can look at Jesus, you read about his life, and two, you look at the life of uh, Philip, right? And you see his ministry. There was a time he was in uh, Jerusalem in the beginning, right? He was at Jerusalem when, when, the, uh, when Peter preached. From there, he went into Samaria. From there, he went into Judea. Then he goes into uh, Asia Minor. So, you, sorry? I don't know if he went into Iconium, uh, but he went into Asia Minor. He goes into Corinth at one time. Then we see him at another place. He goes into Africa later on. Right, so you see that his ministry is more of reaching out to people, right? Yeah. Is there any question? No. Okay. All right. So, Second Timothy chapter four, verse five. Second Timothy four five. Now, again, this is the last epistle of the Apostle Paul. 
his last letter and what does he say to Timothy? Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. But you be watchful in all things, endure reflections, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Mm. Now it's interesting, no? What is Timothy's responsibility right now? Timothy, what's he doing right now? Yeah. You should know this, but <laughs> what is Timothy doing right now? Which church? Ephesus, right? So so remember, so these two letters are personal letters written to Timothy, who's pastoring a church in Ephesus, and he's a young man, probably 35 years old. Right, and he's pastoring a church. Now, what is he saying? Be watchful, keep your head in all situations, end your hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Now, why would Paul say that? Well, Paul could have said, Do the work of a pastor, right? But we see that the role of an evangelist is not. It's not like okay, this is what only this is not this is the only thing that I'm going to do, and you know, or or the pastor. This is the only thing that I'm going to do. No, we started this uh, session, session number one. We said there will be times God can inter intervene or interchange those gifts that we have. You can be a pastor, you can be an evangelist. Yeah, they can overlap, right? So you can be a, a, a evangelist, you can be an apostle. Can be a pastor, apostle, and an evangelist. Right? Now, here, you know, Timothy is a pastor in the church in Ephesus, but he's saying, do the work of an evangelist. That means what? What did we see? The Greek word, preach the gospel, testify of good tidings, be a bearer of good tidings. Right? Um, and, and so, with all of this, we see that in the early church, evangelists began to grow. There were evangelists. So if we go on, we see Lydia became an evangelist. Right? Uh, uh, you know, Paul, Paul, of course, was one, Barnabas. Then we see Tidicus, uh, who started the church in Colossae. Right? So I can give you all these names. Uh, so all these people became evangelists. Aquila and Priscilla, what were they doing? They were evangelizing. Right? Then later on, they came into the church in Rome. Right? So, so if you see all of this, the early church functioned on the gift of the evangelist. Right? Now, let's look at the disciples of Jesus. Pastor, is there any difference between these three things? Like, uh, yeah. So one is a noun. It's, it's the name of that, what it means. The verb is... So the noun is the word. So for example, our name is a noun. The verb is the meaning of our name. Right? So whatever our name is, it's our name. Right? But the verb is the meaning of our name. So here, yeah, yeah. And the third one is the title. So if you, if you look at it as a person, you take a person, David. Right, his name is David. Anybody know what's the meaning of David? <laughs> a strong, strong refuge and a tower. Right, so David, strong, and what is his title? Mr. David or King David. Right, so it's those three in one. Right, so, so those three Greek words are all in one. Right? Do you understand that? Right? Okay. The disciples of Jesus. Let's see what they did. Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. <clears throat> Mark chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. He appointed 12 Designate, he appointed 12, designating them apostles. 14 and 15. Right? 14 and 15. 
he appointed 12 designating them apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons mm. he appointed 12 dis designating them as apostles and what did he tell them to do go out and preach sorry preach. go out and preach right so that's the mandate that he has given all of us here to the disciples he said go out he ca he called he said go out and preach luke 9 1 through 6 and uh, somebody else can open luke 10 1. luke chapter 9 1 to 6 then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases he sent them to preach the kingdom of god and to heal the sick and he said to them take nothing for the journey neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money and do not have two tunics apiece whatever house you enter stay there and from there depart and whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city shake off shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them so they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere yeah Look at verse 6. Verse 6 is interesting. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Again, the mark of an evangelist. Go ahead. Next one. Luke 10, 1. Yeah. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go verse 8 whatever city you enter and they receive you eat such things as are set before you verse 9 and heal the sick there and say to them the kingdom of god has come near to you verse 70 uh, then the 70 returned returned with joy saying lord even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpent and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Yeah, thank you. So we see here a structure. First, Jesus chose 12 apostles. He said, go preach they came back and jesus said counted 72 others he said go from village to village pray for the sick heal them so they went out came back and said you know when we prayed when we uh, prayed over people they received healing and uh, many were who were sick had received healing and and so we see here that the lord jesus set the example of saying go out right now in the end of his ministry when the lord jesus was resurrecting we know the lord's commission right he was resurrecting what did he tell his disciples go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father son holy soul he gives them the commission right now remember that jesus doesn't do something that he didn't do or he doesn't say something which he didn't do so when we look at this the scriptures 12, go do what you have to do. Preach. 72, go do what you have to do. And in both places, Jesus says, I have given you authority. He's not sending us and saying, okay, you go and I will, you know, later I will, I, I will see if there's any problem, I will come. No. When he sends us, he gives us the authority. Right? You know, sometimes when we are out in ministry, Especially now, we need to be wise. Right? We need to, the way we reach out, the way we talk, very important to be wise. But it must also be important to be bold. Right? Uh, so last Sunday, we talked about understanding God's timing. Right? The Lord Jesus, there were times he boldly came out because he knew that nobody could touch him. But there were times he said, no, I need to go away. Right. He went into Judea, he went into Samaria, he stayed there for a while. So you and I, as disciples, as evangelists, right, are called for this. 
to go out. Now, you may be a worship leader. You may be a ushering team, sound and setup team, right? media team, whatever team you are in, it does not matter. We are called to evangelize, to be bearers of good tidings. Now, every time we do this, we are fulfilling the commission of God. Right? We're fulfilling what God is telling us to do. You know, sometimes people ask me, why do you go? You know, now you're a pastor. You don't have to go on the streets and evangelize. You don't have to do that. I know I don't have to do that. I don't have to. I can go sit in an AC office. <laughs> you have been in the office? Is it comfortable? Very nice. There's an AC right above me. <laughs> I switch it off, I switch it on whenever I want. It's very comfortable. But that's not what God is... You know, when God puts something in our heart, uh, it's not about comfort. It's about fulfilling uh, fulfilling something that God has put in our hearts. Right? Fulfilling a, a desire right, to see lives touched, to see lives transformed. Right, let me give you this example. Last week, we were just, you know, I, I saw this couple. They were walking, and I just went and spoke to them. I said, "Hey, uh, you know, uh, well, are you are you Christians?" Or I said, "No, we are not Christians, but we do believe in a few things." And so I began to just talk to them. Now this is on the street. Was I scared? Was I nervous? Yeah, maybe. Right? But I knew that you know God has said, "I'll give you the power. I'll give you the authority. I'll give you the strength." So I began to speak to him, them, and they said. I told them, see, here's where we meet. I can send you the location. I sent them the location. Okay. To my surprise, on Sunday morning when I was preaching, uh, I could see them. So they both have come. I was really surprised. Right? So I was waiting to finish the, my sermon and you know, just go and speak to them. Right? But I finished the sermon. First day I went and I went and spoke to them. I said, thank you for coming. Uh, then they said, you know, your, the sermon about God's timing was, I think, exactly for me only. You know, because, you know, God, I'm waiting on God for this. I'm waiting on God for that. I've been praying to all the gods. Even your Jesus I've been praying to. That's what she said. She said, even your Jesus I've been praying for. Nothing's happening. But today I understood many things. If we pray, doesn't mean it'll fall from heaven. So she started preaching to me. I said, preach. How much more you want to preach? You preach. Okay. So I was just listening. I said, and she said, I'll see you next week. I said, yeah. Now, this is a family. Husband, wife, two children. They come to church. Now, over time, they will themselves become believers. You don't have to do anything. Because our church folks are there. People are there. They will minister. right? And the word, the worship, everything will minister to. But it was just a simple thing of just going and talking. Right now, there's no point, you know. Last week, I was saying, No, I want to see 150 people in church. I can't sit and sit under the AC and say that that's going to happen. I can't do that. Right? For everything that we declare, every word of faith, there should be an action. Right? And so, the Lord Jesus is saying, You and I, no matter how big we become, it's okay to step out, to evangelize, to, to reach out to people. We are bearers of good tidings when we preach the gospel. Okay, let's look at Philip. Each time Philip is mentioned in scripture, he is ministering in a different location. Right? Look at Acts chapter 6. He's in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 8, he's in Samaria. Acts 8, 27, he's in the desert. Acts 8, 40, he's in Azotus. Then the scripture says he preached the gospel in all the cities. Imagine Philip preached the gospel in all the cities, going all across these places, preaching the gospel. Right? No facilities, no tracks, no Bibles, no social media, nothing. Right? All he had was the gospel. Just the words, the testimony, right? Acts 28 was 21 was 8, finally, where Philip is called the evangelist when he's preaching in Caesarea. 
Now, again, we looked at the difference between the ministry gift and the ministry function, right? All of us have the gift, right? All of us can flow in the gift, but there's also the function where God, for example, Philip, he had the function. The Apostle Paul, did he be an evangelist? Yes. Did Peter be an evangelist? Yes. Peter, James, John, everyone were evangelists. But then there was also the function. Here, they recognized the function of Philip and said, Philip, the evangelist. The same thing when we look at Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, right? Uh, it says that, and then they called Paul, Apostle Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts, right? After a certain while, they recognized the gifting, the function of this great man, Paul. So what does it teach us? Next, we'll go from the evangelist. We'll talk about the pastor. We'll talk about the teacher. Remember that all these gifts can overlap. But there will be times when some of us know this is our gifting. You know it. God has called you to do this. Right? So, for example, I think I've mentioned to some of you, you know, God's called you for this. Right? And and you know it. When you look at a person, there are sometimes when you when you look at a person, you know this is pastor written all over him. Right? All over him is written pastor. <laughs> right? Or it's written evangelist all over the person or worship leader. Uh, now that is that is that is the function which God gives us. But it doesn't mean that we don't do other things, right? We can also function in the other areas. An evangelist's primary function is to preach the gospel. As an exhorter, he goes into existing churches to conform them and stir them up for the need of revival. Now, look at current day evangelists, right? Uh, what are they doing? They're preaching the gospel. They're having these big events. They get invited to churches. They go to churches and preach. Now, uh, here are some things that I want to address. Right? It may not be in your notes, but these are very important things. An evangelist, his responsibility is to build the church. Right Now, anytime an evangelist comes in to a church, and, you, and you, if you see there is some kind of a division. Now, let me give you a real life instance, what happened in our city. I'm not going to name names, but it happened in our city. Uh, this pastor, he invited this great evangelist, right? wonderful evangelist. Uh, he was a healing evangelist. And uh, he invited him. He preached his heart out, the evangelist. As usual, he prayed at the end of the service, signs, miracles, and wonders. People were healed. All of that happened. Now, what he, what he did was, at the end of the service, he started giving his card to people. People started calling him. Pastor, I got healed last week. Uh, brother, I got healed last week. Can you pray for my, my sister also? Can you pray for my father? Yeah, I can pray for you. You come here to this place, I will meet you and I will pray for you. Thank okay. you. What happened after that? From suddenly, from being in the church, their mind is not in the church on Sunday. Their mind is healing. I want healing. Now the pastor is doing all he can. He's preaching his heart out. He's preparing. He did all the hard work to start the church. And in a moment, it's caused division here. So these people are in the church. You see, but that that evangelist healed, no. You don't have the gift of healing, so we want, we want healing. Now, is this, uh, is this something new? No. They ran after Jesus for healing only. Right? <laughs> Nothing else they wanted. They didn't say, oh, Jesus, you're the best. No. They all wanted healing. Heal, go. Those 5,000 people, heal, go. That's all they wanted. But here, what happened was it became a big problem. It was very sad. This evangelist eventually said, okay, I'll start my own church. He started his own church. All the people from this church went to. There was hurt. 
there was pain, there was anger, there was division in the body of Christ. Right? All because of what? He had a God-given gift. Right? God brought healing, miracles. God used him. But he didn't use wisdom. Just gave his card, told people, now what happened? What about this pastor? What will he feel? Maybe for years he has worked hard. He doesn't have the gift of healing and miracles, but he's wonderful. He's God has called him to be a pastor, to start a church, minister to people. So two different gifts, but there was division. And our entire city, this happened about eight, ten years back. Entire city, everyone knew about it. Some people were saying, that's his wish, evangelist. He wanted to start, let him start. Some people are saying, how can he do this? What's happened in the body of Christ? It was such a terrible thing to read about. It was very bad to read about, right? There was in one city division between people as believers. So if, if God is calling us to be an evangelist, always remember we are going there to build them up. And if there are people who see, people will come, right? They like healing, they like prophecy. Even now, right? there are times we pray and the person will be standing and looking at me. So, what? Any prophetic word? I said no word. <laughs> oh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the same thing happened. Uh, same thing happened to my dad. My dad is also a pastor, so he was mm -hmm. talking to this particular person. So they got him to talk about the word, and you know he revealed some things that they didn't know when they were going to church. Mm -hmm. So immediately he called and he said that the uh, pastor is going to come to your church now. Going to say he said, "No, no, don't do that. You go to your church. You tell your pastor about this. See this type of thing that yeah. I learned from the Bible. You don't leave that church and come yeah. here. It's not yeah. a good thing." Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That that's the right thing. Somebody had to take all these things. See, uh, the same thing happened uh, to us also. Like mm -hmm. when this, uh, the uh, literally, it's thirty families went. So uh, dad was, uh, dad felt very bad, and he was, he was sharing with a senior pastor. So he was saying like, I don't know, I, I didn't agree to him, but uh, he was saying like the senior pastor. So this. Finally, they are not going to, I mean, they are not becoming like Gentiles, they are not going back. They are going somewhere to God only. So you don't have to worry because it's not your people. It's They, they came to your church because of God. So you don't have to worry. Uh, you, 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 I mean, I mean, you worked hard for them. That doesn't mean they are not, they are not your own. Yeah. So <clears throat> see, when we look at God and you look at the Lord Jesus, he didn't work arbitrarily, right? He didn't just do whatever he feels like doing. There was order, there was in in he did things in a certain way. Now the question is: a pastor has worked hard. He has ministered to them, right? He started a church, he has worked hard, right? It's not easy, right? And if you're talking about towns and villages, it's not easy to get one family, it's a big deal, right? So now this pastor has worked hard. He's built the church. And if somebody, especially like, you know, an evangelist comes, does these miracles, takes people and go, it is obviously as a pastor, I would say, hey, what is this? You know, God has made me the shepherd. right? So I have to look after my sheep. Right? Now, if I know that somebody from our church is going to uh, Jehovah's Witness, obviously I should say, hey, See, I won't, at APC, something that we follow is we don't force them. But I would feel bad. I will say, hey, why? Did, was our teaching not proper? What, what is it that you, who, who diverted your mind? Right? So I would want to know. Because as a shepherd, I must look after my sheep. I must care for them. So by saying that, okay, anyway, they're going to God, it's true. But God has made you the shepherd for these people. Now, over time, if if the sheep decide and they say, no, no, I want to go from this place, that's nothing that I can do. And we, can't, we can't hold on to people. They just let them go. The hurt may be there. We may feel you know, sad. But remember that God will, you know, if two goes, God can add 10 more to us. Right? You just uh, have a clear conscience, clear heart. 
But when these things happen, it is definitely painful. But as a shepherd, you deal with it. You talk to them. Right? Something that we do at APC is if, if people want to go to another church, we ask them to write. We ask them for feedback, right? They We give, send them a link. There's a form. They fill up. Why do they want to go? Sometimes they say, uh, it's too far away. Sometimes they say, evening service. Sometimes they say, we want more fellowship or they want different style of worship. So different reasons. So at least we know that you know we are doing our part. And see, now APC is big. So when people go, come, we may not know. But I'm sure when we were small, it would have hurt, you know, even if one or two families leave. So I would say to respond to that, as a shepherd, you have to look after it. You have to find out what it is. If it's something from our side, get it corrected. If it's something that is not from your side, find out the reason. Try to support them. If they still decide to move on, let them go. Right? Yeah, if they deceive, then you can tell them, see, brother, we've been talking about this. You know God's word. But if they still say, no, right, no, I want to go there, we cannot control them. Right? We cannot forcefully tell them. Now, look at Apostle Paul. Right, He says... Um, uh, towards in the, uh, towards the end of his ministry, in, I think in Timothy, he says, there were believers, Demetrius, he was a believer, steel worker, he used to work in steel. He was a believer. He worked with Apostle Paul. And towards the end, Paul says, he has abandoned the faith. Imagine that. He's with Apostle Paul, with the greatest man apart from Jesus did all these wonderful miracles, saw the ministry, saw his life. And now Paul is saying he has rejected us. He has moved on. He's been, he, he does not believe in the gospel. So there will be people like that. Right? But if we are called to any church, right, or if we are as pastors, we are inviting people to church, to your church, give them, you know, you can give them, uh, a, a letter, or you can sit and talk to them. I tell them, see, the church is 50 people. This is what we believe. These are the things you can speak on. Right? These are the uh, you know topics you can. So one thing that we do is we, if there's a guest speaker, many times we ask them send your sermon notes before preaching. Right? Send the sermon notes. And if you notice, there's hardly any guest speaker. <laughs> Very busy. Maybe once or twice a year. No, it's always our team because we know what we are doing. Right? So very rarely we, uh, but even when we do, there are certain guidelines. So this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Right? Uh, no getting angry, rebuking, and shouting on the mic. We are not like that. Right? Uh, holy anger and shouting and all of those things. No. So there are certain ways. So even you, if you are inviting people to your church, give them guidelines. Now they may say, who are you to give guidelines? Say, you are the pastor of the church. That's why I'm giving you the guidance. The moment, the moment they say, they say, oh, who are you? No, I'll preach however you want. You tell them to go back. right? Because they're not humble enough to follow instructions. They may be uh, preaching in front of 10,000. They may say, hey, I preach in front of thousands. Here are only 50 people. But that is your 50 people. It is yours. That 10,000 is not uh, their, their wish. But this 50 is yours. You look after them. So you tell them. No taking phone number of anyone. No putting pamphlets. No, you tell them openly. No problem. Right? Don't put your pamphlets of the next meeting. Right? Don't take anybody's phone number. Don't talk to the worship leaders and say, can you come lead worship in my program? Don't do all that. Tell them openly. Now, it's nothing like uh, rebuke. It's not like you uh, hate them. No. What did Jesus say? Hey, before Abraham was, I am. Was it sounding nice? <laughs> you destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. Right? There was, see, Jesus also was stern in places. You have to be stern. God has given you the authority. You have to do it. What are you doing? You're not trying to put the person down, but you're protecting the church. You're protecting your people. So we have uh, pastors' meetings. Um, we used to have pastors' meetings, Bangalore pastors' meetings. We have guidelines. And down, every pastor who comes will receive the guideline. No pamphlets. 
no taking phone numbers of our staff no asking our staff what they do where they go everything is in guidelines so there were times people came and kept the uh, tracks uh, you know their next meeting and all i said open their email we'll make them read it it's written don't do so request you not to do this they know it now some of them didn't come back after that that's okay is it are we safe we are safe right so it's nothing wrong you put it on paper make them sign so you don't trust me no sign it's okay it's not about trust it's about doing things the right way right so you can so there's a book called divine order in the city white church now the reason i'm saying this quite sternly is because i know many stories i don't give all the stories but there are many examples like this and it's painful right one young pastor will come he'll dress up nicely with you know suit and a boot and all those fully suited up and this other pastor is 40 years old he he doesn't like he likes a shirt like me <laughs> right what will happen these people want to go there why because he screams in the mic this one talks as if everyone are full fall asleep <laughs> right so it's not about that right it's about how we protect our church our people is our people and god puts puts us as leaders we must be wise right so if you are a pastor we'll talk about the ministry of the pastor also uh set these guidelines nothing wrong if they are offended that means this the heart is not right if they are not offended good come preach go right let people be healed good now what happens if church members come and ask can i get that pastor's number evangelist number i want to go talk and pray sit and talk to your church member tell them okay so this is the thing i'll give you the number but remember that we are together we are one body right you explain to them what they do at the end is their option but you have done your part right so as an evangelist yeah take the numbers of our church or telling our church members not to go and attend their uh, meetings is it not like being in no, we don't so so the thing is we don't tell others don't go right so for example at church in uh, like at apc anybody can go anywhere you want to go for any meeting you go you want to go join their church also go right but but what we are doing is as a as a church we want to protect our sheep and we are not saying don't go go be blessed wherever you want to go meetings go uh but there's a way there's divine order that's required in that right so we're not being insecure saying don't go anywhere no go right so even your church members you can say go if they if there's a person who comes visiting your city great evangelist or a preacher let them go the moment you control them they'll want to go right so you say you want to go go so let them go right now now this is where you give freedom to them we we don't hold them back but if they decide to move to another church we must know the reason why it's not like hey, they have moved okay so god will send 10 more people that is true but we also need to know the reason because you are a shepherd right it could be because of us it could be because some things that they desire now no church is perfect you will find people hopping from one place to another every time so so don't worry about that our responsibility is to look after them right so if any one of us as evangelists are going to a church preach and run away from <laughs> so don't run away but preach minister and just walk away right if people ask for number and all just say you talk to your pastor that like what uh, you said right so that would be the wise thing to do right okay an evangelist may also help start churches as philip did in samaria right now uh, even if you look at uh, the apostle paul um in some places he didn't start the church right so colosse colosse also he didn't start the church right so it was tychicus who went to colosse and then they started the church so so when he's writing to colosse he doesn't know the believers meaning he hasn't seen them but you know he helped in starting the church 
So there will be times evangelists will start churches and they may hand over to other people. I haven't heard of it happening right now, but I'm sure there may have been instances in our city or in our nation as well. Right. Uh, John commends in third John one, five and nine. He commends the church for taking care of its itinerant preachers. And in doing so, the believers became fellow helpers of the, of, to the truth. It is possible that these strangers were evangelists. So as believers, uh, John is writing later on, he says, the, the church was looking after their evangelists, taking care of them. Right? And then we see also the life of Apostle Paul in Romans 15, 7 to 20. And we know the, uh, the life of Apostle Paul, 17 years of ministry, there's missionary journeys, the places that he visited, the churches that he planted, the letters that he wrote, uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful evangelistic work. And that is even bearing fruit right now, right? So, uh, so from what we know in the early church, the evangelist was a very powerful role. And even now, right, it, it, you know, I want to end with this. Now, when we look at evangelists, it, it, it's, it's not something that we may always want to follow because nowadays in cities, we, you know, we see people becoming evangelists and it's more of a show. It's more of, you know, of course, God has given them gifts and talents and, uh, but sometimes it becomes like a, you know, a whole show and a whole, and that's not what we want to do. Right? Uh, the gospel is not a pompous gospel. It is a simple gospel, simple belief, simple people, simple faith, right? So just being a natural, uh, you know, from, you know, sometimes people send us clips of uh, what's happening around us. And it is really painful to see these things happening. Right. By the body of Christ, the scriptures have been, you know, twisted. Uh, men and women of God have lost the integrity of preaching the gospel. We don't want to do that. The Bible says, as an evangelist, we are bearers of good tidings. Right. So uh, we'll pick up next uh, next week. Uh, I think on Wednesday is our next class. Wednesday? Tomorrow? Tomorrow's our, Thursday is our next class. So we'll pick up Thursday and we'll look at restoration of the ministry of the evangelist. All right. All right, let's just close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for teaching us, Lord. We thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that uh, you will continue to empower us and equip us, Lord, that uh, no matter what we are called to do, that we would walk with purity of heart, with one mind, with one heart. And Lord, in everything that we do, that we may glorify and honor your name, Lord. We commit our students, everyone who are sitting here and those online, Lord, we speak a blessing over their lives and pray, Lord, that you will use them greatly for your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless.